Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome. This is another episode of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Today's episode, my guest, none other than Don Wilson, also known as The Dragon. Stick around, enjoy. If you're new to the show or just want to check out what we're doing, please go to whistlekick.com, see everything that we make, all the things that we're involved in, from our products to our consulting services, our training programs. There's so much available over there. Please go check it out. Use the code PODCAST15 if you buy anything in the store. I'll see you at the outro. Hey, hey. <laughs> welcome. I'm happy to be here finally. And I hey. apologize about, we had a problem. It well, happens. I had a problem getting back to my office and then getting hooked up last time. Yeah. So um, it's all good. Yeah. It's all yeah. good. You don't, you are nowhere close to the record for the longest time between when we started and when we finally got somebody on the show. I'm trying to remember who oh. it was. There's somebody that's, it, it was five years. You've been doing yeah. this for five years? Uh, we're in our eighth year. Oh, congratulations. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, we've been doing this for a while. It's been fun. Get oh. to meet a whole bunch of people. Tons of your friends have been on the show. Hey, <laughs> now, you know what? I haven't watched your show, but is it? It's okay. Uh, well, what is the official name? Whistle Kick or something? Or Mar Whistle Kick is our company. We do a, a variety oh, oh, of different oh. things, you know, apparel, protective equipment. We do events. Uh, but Martial Arts Radio is this show. So it's Whistlekick okay. Martial Arts Radio. Okay. Well, then I have a very good reason to be here. <laughs> you do. You agree. <laughs> and correct me if I'm wrong. Doesn't your daughter go to Middlebury? Yes, she does. Uh, Vermont. Yeah. Yeah. So She's graduating if, this year. If Vermont knew how to make roads that went east-west, I could be at the college in 45 minutes. Really? Uh, I'm in wow. Montpelier. Well, I bet it's cold where you are then. I was just out walking in a t-shirt. Oh my god! It's six. It's like 61, 60. What does this say? Uh, it's not telling me. It's like sixty degrees out. It's oh great. Oh my god! You know, yeah. I'm in Los Angeles, and uh, that's one of the reasons why everybody likes to live in here is Mediterranean climate. You know, we never get the uh, ice and the snow and all that. And yeah, right. but we've yeah. had a drought. For, for over 10 years and yeah. that is really it, messed up la the drop yeah it, it's it i am i am worried i keep seeing uh, news articles about what they're going to do with the colorado and and everything and you know well we, you know what I, i'm looking right now i'm in my office this is yeah. my home office I put it right in the front of the house so if i have anybody come over they don't walk through wander around through the house sure, they just sure. come right in the front door is right there and and i'm now looking out into the yard at through through windows and i have no grass we purposely got you know a big yard for the kids and everything and it is, it's got it's like an acre of yard but an acre of dirt now <laughs> I, I have an acre and it's still pretty green i mean there are a lot of leaves oh, down well you right know now, uh, but... <laughs> look look if that's the only problem you have in living in california then we're, we're lucky you're, do, you're doing all right yeah most most of the things here are all positive nope. so i i actually have my next door neighbors just leaving people are leaving though mm. because i guess tax it's financial reasons yep. you know it's it's expensive in la and and, and I'm, I'm thinking it's property taxes or something i'm not really sure what what, what why people are leaving but it's, um, it's yeah, the whole, it's the whole pile it's the whole pile of, of living there versus elsewhere you know vermont well, you know, in florida is, right. and the people my friends here uh, he's a director he's directed yep. me in two films he moved to florida and uh, he feels like, uh, you know, he's, I guess he's getting his director's guild retirement or something, which is not bad. And then, uh, but it goes further if you're in Florida than it sure. does in LA. Oh, absolutely. I think so everything goes why, further. Yeah. My boxing Florida. trainer went to Texas. Yeah. Um, you know, so, so it's like my agent passed away a year ago, mm. unfortunately for me. Mm -hmm. You know, I, he, I had him since 1985, one agent. And wow. yeah, you know what? And I, I, I thought, you know, well, I don't need a agent, but the reality is, you do need you. Here's the thing: is that that agent did a lot of work for his ten percent. Mm. He's on top of all the new films coming up before something gets made, like The Matrix. Let's say he knows there's a martial arts sci-fi being done by the studios, and you know. I, but me, I'm like retroact. I, if people really want me, then they just call me. They figure out, they find me somehow through people that know me, and they ask me to be in their films, and I do it. But that's no way to run your career, you know. That's, that's but you, just, you, you got to get there somehow, right? You, you can't well, start you know, off. I, I, I've been acting for 40 years yeah. now, believe it or not. Uh, 1982, I did a Chinese movie. Um, what was the name? 
New York Chinatown. And uh, yeah, so it wasn't a career move. I just I just appeared as a bad guy because I was very popular in Hong Kong as a fighter. I had six mm. fights there. So they thought putting me in a movie would be good. And I was a bad guy. And, and it, I guess it was good for the movie. And then, but, but I just went back to my kickboxing then. And then I met Chuck Norris. And he said, Don, when you retire, move out to LA, get an agent and be an actor. Chuck suggested it to me. He said, it's a great second career. And um, that's what I did. I moved out there in 85. And of course, they weren't looking for six foot tall Asians with Southern accents. But, because but, I'm from the South, Florida. <laughs> but um, I get accidentally called in for a movie called Blood Fist. Accidentally, because they were looking for Caucasian Lee, because they were trying to do something like Bud Sport. I don't want to call it a ripoff, but that's technically what it was, Blood Fist. It was just Blood Sport. But with me instead of Van well, Damme. There are really only like three plots in martial arts yeah, films. So say. it's kind of hard to not rip off something that's already been done. Well, listen, I've done 30 movies. I started in 30 movies now. That's so, and I've done versions of other people's movies. Yeah, I did a version of Death Wish. I did a version of um, Under Siege. Mm -hmm. um, it, mine was called Ground Zero. Mm -hmm. Oh. Gosh, uh, something just happened. That's okay. We just it was a little bit of stutter in the network. Oh, you know what it is? The network connection. Are calling me, okay. I think. Yeah, that's what it is. So you know what though? Um, I don't know how you you run your business, but I, I when I don't recognize the number, I never pick it up. Unless I'm because expecting a call, I don't answer it because it's the always only people it's that have my scam. number. Yeah. Well, you know what? They're all. I get a lot of messages left. Uh, they're trying to yeah. They're trying to get me to buy a house or do refinance or. All kinds of crazy stuff. Yep. But um, yeah, I only, if if it pops up and I see the name, then somebody that I know and I do business with or have friendship with, sure. and um, then then I absolutely pick up. Sure. I, I, I want to go back to you uh -huh. being a bad guy in your oh, first film, because first that's, that's something that I, I've, I've heard anecdotally a lot of actors are really afraid of. They're afraid of being typecast as a bad guy and how that plays out. Um, well, you know, you know what? Maybe I should have been afraid of it, but I, I but I knew so, so little about the movie industry that I don't think I even I may have heard the word stereotyped or typecasting. Or, yeah. But I didn't, I had never dealt with it. You know, I didn't get into kickboxing with the idea that oh, this is going to lead to a film career. Right. And um, uh, yeah, so I didn't even think about it. Now, listen, at this point in my life, in my career. I played the good guy over and over and over. I, I mean, I'm not saying I, I, if somebody's got a film, I won't be the good guy. But what's <laughs> enjoyable is doing the different things. That's sure. why we saw Clint Eastwood. At, at one point in his career, he did a comedy. Yeah. Every which way but loose, I think, or something. But with a, he had an orangutan in it. Then he did a love story with Meryl Streep. Yeah. I mean, he just got so tired of being the tough guy that shoots everybody and kills everybody. And I, I, I know that feeling. Mm -hmm. Do you know, and, and and luckily for me, um, my agent told me uh, I I got paid more to do one scene with Billy Zane than I used to star in movies. I did yeah. a scene where I was just a Japanese businessman, no martial arts in it at all, and it was in a science fiction. I don't know if it'll ever come out. It may already be out. I don't know. But when you just fly in, do one scene, and fly out, easy. You know, I may never see the movie. I don't. I don't know. <laughs> Michael Madsen told me that that's that he'll do. 20 movies in a year he doesn't watch the movies and he said john he told me about my career he said, you're leaving money on the table if all you do is star in one genre and i go mm -hmm. what are you talking about well now i know now i know you can make as much if not more money just being quote what they call character actor mm -hmm. going in playing the bad guy sure uh playing the best friend uh I, well what i just did in um i guess it was like uh about three months ago I got called to play an American Indian. Well, I better call, get it right. No, it's called Native American. Mm -hmm. And um, because they don't like being called Indians because uh, that, 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 that means they're from India. That's why the settlers called them Indians because right. they thought they were so dark. They thought they were Indian. They were from India. But you call them Native Americans. And right. I played a good guy, though. So there was no backlash. There was no Native Americans writing me on Facebook saying, what are you doing taking a job away from a a real Indian. Was it was right? it like Billy Jack Six? No, no, no. What? I, 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 really, I really want somebody to reboot that. Listen, it, it, it may. It, it, I don't know if it's politically correct, but some Mexican bad guys crossed the border, kidnapped some white women for sex trafficking, 
mm-hmm. and go across the border. And a uh, sheriff, this is set in the West, the, the Wild West. Sure. A sheriff gets together a posse, but they need, of course, their Indian scout to tell them mm. where the bad guys went. So I'm down there looking at the hoofs and telling them, well, oh, they just let, we're going to go here. And and I don't even know how to ride a horse. They, they they asked me in the beginning, how are you with horses? And I said, well, I'm not scared of them. or I'll get on one. I'll, I'll, I'll do whatever you want. But the shooting was so fast. They didn't have time to, for me to learn how to mm. ride when we're doing like the scene is written. And we'd ride up three, three guys, a sheriff and another guy, me. And we stop. I look at the ground. I point where we're going. I tell them we got to go this way. So you got to make that horse stop, move over this way, do this. And, and my horse had to be in the lead. So here's what they do, though. This is in Arizona a couple of months ago. Um, that horse only works with actors. That's what these horses. There's a facility in Phoenix where I guess everybody goes. All the stuntmen came from there. Oh, wow. And uh, I've never made a Western, so I didn't know they have these areas of the country where just Western towns, Western outfits, if all you could ever want or it's right there. All you got to do is fly in your actors from LA, put them in a hotel and you're, you're in Mex, you're in Texas or whatever. Oh, what a riot. Yeah. So the horse, after like two rehearsals, it knew what to do and it just did it. I mean, my hands were on the reins, but I didn't make it go left or right. And it, it positioned itself. It stopped. It hit the mark right where it's supposed to. <laughs> I did my dialogue. I looked at the ground and I told him, you know, what I was supposed to say. And yeah, uh, the horse was a better actor than me. Let's put it that way. That's oh, that's a riot. That's so. I, I I had no idea. I but it makes sense. Horses are smart. Uh, I they're know, trained. I, I I grew up riding horses. They they like to have a plan. They like to know where they're going. I totally get it. Yeah. Well, you know what? His plan was don't rely on the actor for the screen direction. He he we rehearsed it a couple of times. The horse knew what to do and he just repeated it. I think it was a she. Actually, she she just repeated it. But um yeah, that that saved me though, because otherwise yeah. I, and there... I hope the not mad at me, because I guess I gave him the impression that you put me on a horse and I'll just be riding and I because I, I, I said I have no fear of them, which I didn't. Sure. But I didn't realize that, that, you know, it's not like riding a bicycle. That could be the you next know? Pixar film. A yeah, Western yeah. from the perspective of the horse, horse actors. Well, you know what? you, Jeremy, you probably won't see me in many re- Westerns. I think that's you know, it? My, One and yeah, done? Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I'm, first of all, I'm Japanese. I mean, you know, they... they, they they probably should get a Native American. I'm sure there's some Native American actors, but you, you know what though? I, I think the act, the director had used me in another movie. Yeah. And um, you know, I, like I said before, I, I became what they call a recognizable name in the show business. Yeah. Not a box office star, I'm not Tom Cruise and Brad Pitt, but people recognize me if, if they see, a great portion of um, martial art action fans, of course would. Of course. You know. Um, I'm 68 now. There's not a lot of Stallone is reviving some of the older action stars and he is expendables, which I'm trying to do something like that. But the truth is action stars should be in their twenties to mid thirties. And and that's when I did most of my films when I was in my uh, mid thirties and, uh, but 68, you know, I mean, I, I, (laughs) it's, it's it's never, it's never too late. Listen, listen, there, there are roles like Liam Neeson in Taken. Yeah. Denzel Washington in The Equalizer. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jack Reacher is a kind of a, char- a franchisable character that, um, not older though, you know, Tom Cruise is still pretty young. I guess he's in his, well, he's not a 20 something guy. No, he's, you know, what, early to mid 50s now? I don't want to age him. Uh, it might be late 40s, maybe. <laughs> But it's been around a while, been around a while. And and I I believe if well written, like uh gosh, what was the one? The Unforgiven. Clint mm-hmm. Eastwood was old when he played that, but he played it. You know what? Here's what I don't want to do. I don't want to do the plastic surgery and the dye my hair and and try to play the 25-year-old kickboxing up and comer. I'll play the coach, the trainer, the 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 um mentor to the kickboxer or whatever. There are roles that um fit me in my age. 
And but but there's not a single kick or punch that I threw in the '90s that I couldn't throw today. And and I think that that's an important piece. Yeah. You know, you look at a movie like Balboa, right? Which, which I haven't seen that. It's uh, what is that? The, the sixth Rocky film. It's the one oh, he plays. Oh, oh, oh it's Ma- another Rocky coming yeah, out. Wow, plays with yeah, Milo Ventimiglia, right. and and the whole premise is he's later in age. I don't know that they they actually quantify how old he is they might and he has to train and fight differently oh of course he's going to go into this exhibition match and you know that that's turning a negative into a positive yeah and i and i think that there's i think there's something to that you know i've i've um you know i've seen you on the mats i've I've had the opportunity to to be on the mats quite a bit with bill wallace Mm -hmm. and you know seen a, a number of folks your contemporaries and like you said there's nothing that you can't still do. Well, and I think calling it. I'm not the fighter I was, but I'm saying for movies, because look, Keanu sure. Reeves can do his movies. Anybody can. I, I tell people I take no self pride for my movies as a as a fight scene because you rehearse and you rehearse. And sure. if, if it doesn't look good, you just cut, you edit it out and you get a different view. And those things are not like I'm proud that I did these fight scenes. No, um, I'm proud that I was a light heavyweight champion for 10 years. I held the title for 10 years, WKA. And um, yeah, I didn't go out a loser. I came out of retirement my last time, won three more fights. And then I retired for the last time, 2002. So I fought for 28 years. Sure. And that's a long career that's for a long kickboxer. Career. Yeah, and it's, and it's inspiring, but you know, I hope you and, don't no, underestimate I I the, to do. the inspiration of, of movies, you know, to, to see someone... You know, why Why was Clint Eastwood so popular so late? Because there are a lot of guys who aren't 20 or 30 looking and saying, okay, where's our representation? Oh, here, here's a guy who's well, he, been doing the, it and we can aspire to be him. Stage. He turned it to a positive. He made yeah. his character, he couldn't see the bad guys. Do you remember that? Yeah. And he hands the gun. I don't know if you saw The Unforgiven, but he hands it to uh, uh, the black actor. Um, you know, You know who I'm talking about. But anyway, he 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 couldn't take the shot because he couldn't see the guy well enough, and um, so instead of being a oh well, they did a movie about astronauts where they got these old astronauts together. Do you remember that one, James Garner, I think, and no. Donald Sutherland. No. It, but anyway, sure. you got to p- take the negative things of aging and make it part of the script. Yeah, literally, like um, you know, my character might not be as fast as he was, and or, or even not be be as strong, but. Um, but then he uses his internal strength to overcome the bad guys. So, you know, in some way, shape or form, I, I think that's the way you work in older actor in a action film is you, you let the positive thing. Well, I've got a script right now dealing with that. It's called um, the, de- de- well, it was originally called blood rate, but they're changing the name to the dependables. <laughs> Obviously, you know why. Because I have no it's, idea it's why. Like this. It's like this blood sport, yeah. blood fist. Right. Now it, you don't have to wonder what kind of movie mine's going to be. No. And you don't have to wonder about the expendables because what it is, is all the B movie guys have agreed to do the movie can, because can we all share? know if it's successful, we can do like the expendables. We'll have a franchise. Right. Can, can you, know, you and I'm share talking names? About, yeah, I'm talking about folks? Billy Blanks, Michael Dudikoff, Cynthia Rothrock, Richard Norton, Olivier Gruner. They've all said, yeah, we're on board. Would you oh, get right. ready? Oh yeah. And it's it's a, I'll tell you the gist of it. Please. It's, uh, it's a, we we older actors are trained, we're the instructors at the SWAT unit um, for LAPD at the police department. Mm-hmm. We're training a, a couple of, a group of young, um, soon to be SWAT unit members. And um we go to the station, we're watching films and things, and all of a sudden there's a terrorist attack downtown LA. The real SWAT unit gets called and they rush down to LA to, to handle this terrorist attack. Some bombs will go off in downtown LA. And what happens is it's a cover for a bank robbery. Mm. Hostages taken, lives at risk, you know, like two, two, I think two hostages have been killed already, whatever. But it comes in, so this is a life or death thing, and they can't pull the people off of the terrorist attack. So the Old instructors are there with young cadets. We tell we order the young cadets not to come to help, try to help us, but they want to help us, of course. And as old guys, we load up with our equipment, get in a van, and we go to stop these bank robbers before they kill all the hostages or whatever. And what ends up happening is 
of course, the young guys come to help us. They show up breaking their orders. And um, we chase the bad guys out of the building. And they run into an abandoned building ready for a big shootout with us. And um, the building's full of vampires. And now it becomes humans versus vampires. So the bank robbers and the cops join forces to fight the vampires. And uh, yeah, I don't want to give away the whole, the whole story. That, that's that's quite but, a plot twist. Well, this is the re, the, the idea of it. You know, look, I was taught by Roger Corman. We did 12 movies together. You yeah. know, he's, he's the most prolific producer in history. 300 movies, and I did 12 of them. And so I've done more than anybody else. I think David Carradine was second with eight movies. Okay. But anyway... Um, he taught me how to take an idea that has been successful for the studios and then do a version of that and get a piece of that audience because you, you won't ever make a movie that loses money because it's already proven that the mm. concept is, is uh, financially commercially successful. Um, and so this one is based on a movie called um, oh, Dust to Dawn. Yeah. Tarantino wrote the script. He's in the movie as well. I don't know if you ever saw it. But it's a normal, it's a normal movie about these criminals trying trying to get across the border and go into Mexico, and they stop at a bar. Yep. And at that bar at midnight, a bunch of the people turn into vampires and kill all the humans. It's a classic. Right. It's well, classic this movie. is this the structure of this is similar. When you start the movie, there's no hint whatsoever it's going to be a um, horror film. Hmm. In the end. It's a typical cop action thing with all these B movie guys. I think it's going to excite everybody because everybody's on board. You know, all the B movie guys you ever saw in the 80s Sounds and 90s. Sounds like a lot of fun. They'll all be in it, but they'll be in it as age appropriate, as yeah. instructors, instructors at the police academy and uh, teaching these young people that want to be SWAT, you know, they, 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 they um, aspire to be yeah. what what we were was the real SWAT unit of the LAPD. And um, yeah, it's it's... It's a it's a, a kind of a Roger Corman concept. It's not going to get nominated for any Oscars, <laughs> but it's going to be highly commercial because they, I believe their nostalgia. Look, the Marshall, the, the Karate Kid, they did the Cobra Kai. Yeah. They got all the old fans watching it because I watched yep. the first episode, which was great. I don't watch TV though, so I can't say I kept following it. But but I know it was successful. At one time, it was the number one show on Netflix. And that's an old concept, right? And they yep. got they got back uh, Ralph Macchio on it. I think they even got Martin Cove in that thing. They, yep. they dug Martin Cove out. Everybody. But, well, they got them all back. They, you know, if Pat Morita was alive, he'd have been in it. Mm -hmm. You know, if he was alive. Absolutely. So uh, I, I think this nostalgia has a value. That, you know, the, the you can't do the exact same thing you did in the past, but you can take the some of the concepts of it, mm -hmm. like, our characters will all be heroic. And in fact, some of the B movie guys, I told them though, there's there's only so many jobs the cops can do. The bad guys have to be also badasses. So a couple of the, several of the um, uh, B movie stars will be the bad guys, and they they will not be in the sequels. Just 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 like Van Damme, I think was the bad guy in one of the Expendables, right? Yep. Well, he's when, not in when, any of this. I think did he get killed off? I, I I'm not sure. I don't remember if he died. It's been a few years. My, my memory for movies is in, isn't their, great. Their, their formula is not to expose the bad guys sure. as action stars and then use them over and over. It's so like, what, what's next with this with this concept? Like when might we see oh, it we're come to the life? money right now. Okay, I was with cool. the attorneys uh, literally last weekend in oh, Florida awesome. because the money is coming from uh, a group of investors that are actually in uh, their uh, their music people. And they're in, their their idea is this, Don Wilson movies get, and they do, I, I get worldwide distribution, every mm -hmm. country, from Turkey to, I mean, weird countries, they all take my movies, and if these music producers put their clients' music in the movie, their mm -hmm. clients' music will be heard all over the world. Uh, now, that's yeah. hard to do with the music, but with my movies, instantaneously, that makes sense. you know, that we just have to make sure it's appropriate for the scene, you know, you can't. You, you know, I can't walk into a, like a rap club and they're playing country western. Right. You know, I mean, right. so so it's going to be, but it's, um, you know, I never realized it's, a, it's an attorney. Um, uh, and um, 
a guy who's uh, he's got like maybe eight Grammy nominations or something. I don't know how many he's won, but um, uh, he got they came up with the idea. I wish I could say I, the financing of films. So th they've raised up some money. And um, that, that's how we're going to make the movie. That, that's the movie. I told them that's the movie we should do first is The Dependables. Because um, it's, it's. It sounds fun. In my opinion, it's for sure going to be a moneymaker because all the buyers from all over the world. You know, I'm bigger in other countries than I am in America by far. I, I've, I've heard but, that. Yeah, and I want to I want to take that opportunity to go back. You, you, yeah. you talked about, I think you said six fights in Hong Kong. Yeah. And you, I, I fought in you Berlin, have, fought you, Rome. You managed to to establish a, a fight career globally in a way that I'm not aware of people outside of, you know, I mean, we've got some limited examples in MMA today. You know, yeah. we've, we've had some professional boxers over the years, but most of the people when we talk about fights and titles, it's North American centric. How did you, yeah, and how you, did you become global? You, the fighter's hometown. He's the main event. Yeah. And he's from Miami. The fights are going to be in Miami. Right. You know, uh, Vegas is the only place where actual fighters will will uproot themselves and go and live there, mm. because you know they, they 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 that's where their big fights are. Yeah, Vegas. You know, um, but you know, I, here here's what happened with me, and and it's kind of many champions probably had the same thing. When I first won the title, other fighters around the world have promoters promoting them in let's say Amsterdam and in and in Berlin I fought Berlin the German champion in Berlin the British champion in London the Italian champion in Rome that's how I got my reputation the Thai champion in my weight division anyway mm. um uh in Bangkok I mean I beat them in their hometowns because I had to knock them out I right. I did not first of all they were great fighters nobody put me up once you win the world title you don't fight the easy guys anymore <laughs> you know the guys that are like uh, 22 and five or something. No, you fight the undefeated fighters hmm. or the number one contenders and uh, other champions. You know, I beat, I think it's the number was 12 other world champions. Hmm. You know, like Murray Smith, uh, I beat him. Dennis Alexio, he's the heavyweight champion. Hmm. I, I beat him. Uh, 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 Oak Tree Edwards, world champion. James Waring, IBF boxing champion and kickboxing champion. I beat many other champions as well as number one contenders, as well as top 10 fighters. Hmm. And uh, uh, I'm the one of the only ones that uh, well, I was the first Kung Fu stylist to win a world title in kickboxing. That's one of my claims to fame. But also, I lasted longer than any other f pro fighter. I started in 74 and my last fight was 2002. That's 28 years. It's a long time. Well, for a, a sport where you elbow each other in the face, <laughs> yeah, knee, for it's sure. all striking. Look, I. I would have loved to done, done MMA because if the guy gets you in an arm bar or something, you just tap out and then no injuries. But my sport, you're there's no we call that quitting. You you're supposed to struggle and struggle and make him snap your elbow. And in kickboxing, you fight till you're unconscious. There's there's no um, you know tapping out or or, or um, uh, <laughs> you know uh, that's called quitting. We call that quitting. Yeah. When, when, when things are going south of the border for you in the fight, you just go, you know what? I, I'll fight you next month. I, I, I'm done tonight. I'm going home. We don't do that. We are expected to fight until we're unconscious, basically. You know, they, then they forgive us. It, but listen, if you get kicked in the leg, I fought broken ribs, broken jaw, broken noses, broken hands. I had two broken hands in one fight. But if I had just stopped and just quit and walked out of the ring, they'd be booing me. What's your yeah. mindset in a fight with two broken hands? Uh, You've got to be thinking people, about it, quitting at that It's not good point. for my opponent. It's not good because my mindset is, is, is listen, it's not the norm because I'm, I was like a wounded animal. Now, they tell you if an animal's wounded, right, it, it crawls into a hole and it's got a bad leg or something, don't stick your hand in there because it will a wounded animal will fight uh, harder, Yeah, you know? And that's the way I was. If I sustained an injury in the ring, what I would, my instinct is to give back more punishment to my opponent. Mm -hmm. In other words, that's like throwing a fuel into a fire, Yeah, you know, to, for me. And it, it and it's, um, you know, I, I think it, it, my whole career, it was 28 years and, 
And believe me, I was, I had fear in my heart when I got into the ring in the beginning. First of all, we thought that if you got kicked in the head, you might die. Mm. So it's a little scary. The first full, we call it full contact karate, Jen. We didn't even call it kickboxing. It, it was so new in America. It was 1974. And they had the first fights that the PKA put on, was mm -hmm. on TV. And my brother saw that. And he wanted to promote the first fights on the East Coast, which was Orlando, Florida. And he asked me if I'd do it. I said, yeah. But we thought, first of all, we fought on a concrete floor. So now think about it. If you get knocked out, you're knocked out when you're up. Now my head is yep. six feet in the air. That means if I fall down, I'm going to bounce on that concrete with my head right. six feet. Now you drop, you drop a watermelon six feet, what's going to happen when it hits the concrete? It's going to smash. Well, that's what would have happened to us. Thank God we, we were so inexperienced, nobody knocked anybody out. <laughs> because after that, they fought on mats. Mm -hmm. And then after the mats, we, got, we figured out you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Boxing already had a ring with a, a, a elevated platform so people could see it better, right? Because when you're fighting on a mat, it, you know, you're looking dead on it. And you get a few rows back, you can't see anything. Mm -hmm. So anyway, we in the professional martial arts arena, uh, pro kickboxers, we're the first professional fighters in martial arts because they added grappling and now we have MMA. Mm -hmm. So you just took kickboxing and added grappling. And uh, listen, there have been many kickboxing champions who became UFC champions. I mean, not kickboxers, uh, strikers. Mm -hmm. Strikers like Machida and, and, and um, uh, Marie Smith won the UFC. Um, strikers can to translate. You just add some grappling and then they Absolutely. can become world, world yeah. champions. But you haven't seen a UFC champion get in a kickboxing ring and win the world kickboxing title. You know, it, it is not... Uh, translatable because because when you take away all their grappling then they look randy couture got knocked out in his last fight by a jump front kick and i've been in kickboxing for my whole since i was 18 years old i'm 68 now that's 50 years i've never seen a white belt jump front kicked in the face and knocked out so that shows you the and randy's a great fighter i'm that's not saying so, anything. Yeah. i love the guy you know he's he's a i consider him a friend but his defense was so low, he was on, both shoulders were square, and he's he's crouching down. He's looking at Machida, and Machida just looks at that, and just jump front kicks, knocks him right out. Jump front kick. So you can reach a high level of MMA and still be um, vulnerable to strikes. Hmm. You know, it, it's changing though. You know, we're talking. How many years ago was Machida knocked out Randy Couture? It's, and in those years, it's only a few. A lot of strikers got success in the ufc a lot of them that they're, yeah. it's not like hoist gracie I, I never saw him throw a left hook or an overhand right i mean the guy never his punches were just what we call arm punches they're, they just he just extended them but they're really mm. not real trained uh boxing style punches um and certainly no combinations hoist never didn't know how to throw uppercut or left hook he could not mix punches up and that's the level and he was dominating mma so that sport has gone from that to guys like um, who's it? Silva Silva. Uh, um, he's he's going to fight um, uh, Logan Paul, I believe. Silva. Uh, it was it was this past weekend. Anderson. Silva. Oh, they, they, Anderson Silva. I, yeah. I didn't you know what what happened. Yeah, uh, Paul by decision. Oh, he won a decision. Oh, okay. Well, you know Anderson Silva's a little old, and and Paul's been in my gym. Yep. You know uh, Logan Paul and Jay. Well, I think I, it was Logan Paul. Logan Paul was in the gym. Those guys are big, strong Husky guys. And they're, they are on the level of beginning pros. Yeah. They're not YouTube. They were YouTubers. But every pro was something else before he was a pro boxer, right? right? They've been putting in the time, for sure. Right. They've got good guys around them, too. And you know what? They're not making nickels and dimes. When they come up to the gym, six cars line up. And it's a Corniche. It's a Rolls. It's a Jag. It's a Ferrari. And, and yeah, that's how he they their entourage pulls into the driveway of the boxing gym uh that, that i train at at woodland hills and um yeah they're making money i believe that he grossed 65 million when he fought ben astrick i believe it was a former ufc fighter wrestler yep. and he knocked him out in the first round yep. but i think logan paul the, the event grossed 65 million yeah they're pulling in a lot of money and and they're you know yeah. love them or hate them love the the business well, side of it or not now. i'm getting offers to participate they're it's pulling people in to a sport yeah. 
as spectators that would not otherwise watch it. People need, they need a story. They need to have an emotional Look, connection to somebody this, in the ring. This is a version of championship wrestling, but it's real. Yes. It's real. They, I really believe they are trying to win their opponents. Uh, I don't, you know, um, there've been recently a few boxing matches where some boxing people in the gym, I train, I don't train in a martial arts gym. I train in a boxing gym. And they felt they were like fixed fights. Now, I'm going to tell you about the greatest fighter on the biggest fan of his. But I tell you right now, I guarantee you that it's a fixed fight. Fixed fights do happen. It's yeah. a business. There's and, a, and it's a money-making business. Yep, there's a lot of money. Muhammad Ali was a world champion. He decides he's going to fight Leon Spinks. Leon Spinks has eight pro fights when he fights Muhammad Ali. Ali fights them, I think it was still 15 rounds. He goes 15 rounds. He doesn't have a fat lip, doesn't have a broken nose, doesn't have, but he loses a decision. He got paid five million. The rematch, in the rematch, he was guaranteed another five. So he turned that fight and he knew that's the one guy he knew he could beat. How can a guy with eight pro fights beat Muhammad Ali? And if you do, you got to really hurt, like, you know, without a, uh, without a, a lucky jaw. knockout. Yeah. No, with the distance he lost, Muhammad right. Ali lost a decision. Right, to that's Leon my point. Like, any anybody anybody can get get a lucky shot. You know, one in a million. Yeah, yeah, that can happen. That can happen. But that's but, not in this case. I believe Ali looked at his business decision. He said, "You know what? Who is it I could fight? He's got a name, and you know, people would pay to see it. And I could lose, and then get my title back one more time." Yep. And Leon Spinks got the phone call from the hey you're gonna fight for the world title muhammad ali on his ninth pro fight i mean you because ali when you're the champion like me when i was i pick who i get let get a shot at me and the title right yeah. i pick them it's not like they i i will say this the, the, the number one contender you you have to fight him every year because the you just get pushed by the uh uh Association WKA, yeah. they're pushing me, pushing because they know what. Well, when I defended it against an undefeated fighter, Dennis Alexio, he sold that fight, the package to NBC Sports World. Mm -hmm. So that's a lot bigger than ESPN, especially back then right. in 1984 when we did it. Uh, ESPN, I you know I fought the first fight on ESPN. Did you really? First fight, yeah, for, in 1979. Yeah, I was, and then then the, they liked it so much they had a fight on every week on mm -hmm. ESPN. But oh, cool. um, but anyway, I. I you you they I'm gonna say they forced me, but yeah, they did encourage. Force me. They, they told me I had to defend it. Other mm. yeah, they'll they'll strip you of your title if you run from them. I don't think in one year, but but I listen. I didn't want to run from anybody, so I fought Alexio. I had the flu. And I Oops, wow. Sorry, sorry. It's okay. my uh, phone fell. It's all right. Okay, we're back on. Yeah, we're on. Um, so. We yeah, I, I, I um, uh, was kind of like pressured into fighting Dennis Alexio uh, when I had the flu and um, I beat him. And then uh, he was off to rematch with me. He turned it down um, and he gained weight. And he became a heavyweight. Why do you, you know, think I, he, everybody why knew he, I was sick? Everybody knew I was sick and I beat him 12 rounds. We fought 12 rounds and um, I beat him with the flu. Do, do you think that's why this recognition that you know I can't even beat this guy when he's got the flu? I'm definitely not going to beat him if he's right. I, I that's what I believe because what I did was not physically beat him up because you don't have to do that. It, it's a sport. You just have to score more strikes on his target areas, the body and the head, and I kick the legs. I can't. I, I matter of fact, he couldn't walk after the fight. They had to carry him around. <laughs> I kicked his legs, but um. There are rules in the fight as well. Um, yeah. You have to throw eight kicks every round. That's mm -hmm. what they, the rule was in 1984. Well, I, when you kick his leg, he couldn't get his kicks in. Two rounds, he, he got like four kicks in one of them, and then I guess he missed two. So he lost the fight point-wise just from not throwing enough kicks. And that was your strategy but going in? It was my strategy. I crowded him after I got my kicks in. And then I kicked him in the lead leg and I damaged it so he, he couldn't really use his left leg, basically. And um, yeah, it's, you, uh, I, I'm not saying anything derogatory about Dennis, but no. I tell people I beat him with my IQ. I just outthought him in the fight. The, the weakness that, I, 
isn't that I case hope. the case with the best fighters? Don't people often talk about the best fighters as oh, yeah. being yeah. very well, intelligent? He, yeah, he he was um well yeah, but um Dennis was one of the better fighters though, so he was not stupid. He had a game plan like Tyson. Tyson, the bell rings every round. He's going to try to knock you out, and guess what? Most guys he knocks out. Okay. Alexio same way. Bell rings. He goes forward. He tries to knock you out. He's got twelve rounds to do it. That's his game plan. Nine times out of ten, he does knock people out. And but that wasn't mine. You know, I if plan A doesn't work, I go to plan B. If plan B doesn't work, I go to plan C. I would adapt, and they say Mayweather does that. That Mayweather has certain things he does consistently, but he will crowd guys, avoid them, tie them up. He will use all the tools he has strategically to win fights over and over and over. And he's been able to beat a lot of people from Pacquiao to uh, to Oscar De La Hoya to all the guys in his weight division. You know, he you don't duck the big names because that's where you make all your money, right? You don't duck them. Um, and I didn't duck them in my weight division. You know, I, I fought all the top guys. What made and, you come out of retirement? Um, the money. Okay. And, you know, a lot of people said, Don, that's, you're fighting for the wrong reason. I said, no, that's the only reason. What they did was this. They, they, they offered me, they called up. Well, first of all, they sent something that was from Revolution Productions. Now, you know, I've been doing movies for years. So I thought it was a movie company. So I, I sent the information. They said, we w- would like to discuss a business opportunity for you. So that didn't sound like a fight to me. So I sent it to my agent. And my agent calls up and he says, Don, this is not a movie. I said, what is it? And he said, it's a fight. They want you to fight. I go, fight? I haven't been in the ring in 10 years. And he goes, well, they want you to fight a heavyweight. And it's uh, the, the, the signing bonus, they called it, was 150000 which means you get it when you sign the contract. And then the offer is 12% of the pay-per-view. Well, I had the same attorney that George Foreman had. So he knows pay-per-view. Oh. Uh, Henry Holmes is his name. I got him through Chuck Norris. So Henry looks at the contract and says, Don, for a first-time fight on pay-per-view, this is a great contract. He says, you make millions of dollars. And I said, well, I'm in. And, and, and you know, I at that time, I really didn't know Dick Kimber that well. You know, I didn't know much about him. Because, um, you know, he's he's a heavyweight. He was up at 220, something like that. And, uh, and what were you fighting at prior to this? 175 is my okay. weight. So what, what I did was this. And this is a trick I used when I came out of retirement. And now I can... I might as well expose it now because I'm not using it anymore. I said, listen, I'm 175. You're 220. Let's meet in the middle. Let's meet at 195. Cruiserweight. And that sounds relatively fair, right? I'll come up 20 pounds, 25 pounds. You come down 20 pounds. Well, it's not fair because I get to eat all I want, lift weights. And they, for the first time in their lives, heavyweights don't diet. He's starving himself. And basically what all, all three of the guys I fought lost their weight with the rubber suit on yep. the sauna. they dehydrated themselves which i don't know if you've ever done it but i've done it you drop up to 50 percent of your your skill up yeah you're, you're tired faster your arms you your body is going to heat up in the middle of the fight because even though you drink the water right after weigh-ins you got it's it's just like 24 hours before the fight yeah. it's, it's not your body same. doesn't absorb it right you're you're, you're substantial. So when I came out of retirement, yes, I was 48 years old by 12 rounds. But I was beefed up, full <laughs> water, full of protein. And I'm fighting young guys, 25 years old. Dewey Cooper was 25 years old. At, I fought at the MGM. Solid muscle. He was weak as a baby. Yeah. He's weak as a baby. So I, I you know, I, I can't brag about, oh, I won three, four. Well, I won. Because- I, I, but the, you know, there's a fight in and out of the ring, right? Yeah. I, I won uh, by uh, not cheating, but uh, uh, getting them to agree to meet in the middle um, was necessary. If I fought Dick Kimber, you know, I knocked him out in three rounds, but I believe at his 215, 220 solid eating, lifting weights, it wouldn't have been the same kind of fight for me. Let's no, put it that, that way. That would have been a heck of a lot more difficult. But, you know, I love that there are some pretty well-established martial arts principles in what you're saying. Get them to fight your fight, if possible. Correct, right. Prepare, right? Fight smart. I mean, we, we've got these threads coming through where... Did you ever take a fight you didn't think you could win? 
Never. Never. And was that, that was that out of no because reason to have confidence? Even when I had no reason to have confidence, I, I always felt. Now listen, thinking you're going to win every fight doesn't mean you won every fight. I got five losses on my sure. record. Four of those losses, though, in my mind, I won those. It was like, like hometown decisions. If you don't knock the guy out, I learned that early on. He's going to get the decision. Yeah. You know, I fought the British champion in England or London, German champion in Berlin, Italian champion in Rome. Do you think I'm going to get the decision? If it's yeah. if it's anywhere close, there's no way. The, it's the promoter, and they want me there just because to build up their local guy. That's why I'm getting the money. But, you know, when the guy's – I said, when the guy's laying on the floor, Captain, and, he, and he's knocked out, I mean, <laughs> there's, no, there's no decision. There's no cheating you. I, so, I've heard it said there's no politics in a knockout. Correct, correct. And then, then um, but you know, it's a lot of pressure to have on when you're doing the bell ring because the guy is good and they are good. You know, Ferdinand Mack was a great fighter, and I end up it's a ten round fight. I end up knocking him out in the ninth round, so that's cutting it pretty close, right? Sure. And, uh, and I didn't knock him out. It was a three knockdown rule was in effect, and I hit him in the body, which he was not expecting because I was I, I kept all my punches to the head, uh, tapping on the body a little bit, but I didn't concentrate. And then in the ninth round, I went down to his body. I dropped him three times, all body shots mm. in the same round. And I won a decision. Now I'm in Berlin, there's 10,000 Germans screaming and all of a sudden dead silence. He's on the floor. And then what was odd was this, this is 1989. I hear some cheering for me. And I'm thinking, well, who the heck are these Germans? So I, when I came out of the ring, it was before the fall of the Berlin wall. And they were soldiers. We have American soldiers were stationed uh, in Berlin. And yeah. they were going, Mr. Wilson, you I, you won me a lot of money because the German fans of this German fighter all bet the American soldiers that I was going to get my rear end kicked. <laughs> and the American soldiers, they didn't know me, but they, they bet on the American. I came out there wearing red, white, and blue. And so when I knocked them out, those guys collected their money. They're German. Friend. What could the German guys say? The guy's on the floor. It's just, you can't even argue about the decision. Right. Right. And um, anyway, it was uh, a good feeling for me to, to, to get the pat on the back from, from our troops because they were winning money. Because I'm sure <laughs> if it was flipped the other way, like, oh, man, you just lost me a month worth of pay. <laughs> you, you talked about why you took your first fight, you know, to help your brother promote. But well, yeah, yeah, but I but, wanted to experience real fighting too. Is that why you kept going? You know, in these yeah. kind of early days. Look, look, yes, my brother wanted to promote it, but look, it, I, we didn't know that if you could have a career like that. I was 18 years old. I was in college. I was an engineering major, and I lost my first fight. Mm -hmm. I broke my hand. It cost me more than uh, I got paid. I got a hundred dollars for the fight, by the way. But the emergency room was more expensive to reset my hand. And so I lost money, lost the fight, got injured, and loved it. It was so exciting. It, uh, people said, well, what's the difference? I said, well, we did point fighting. Everybody had point fighting. Mm -hmm. That goes back in the 60s, Chuck Norris's days. But that's like touch football compared to NFL. Mm -hmm. It's the, the feeling you get when you're a pro fighter and you're actually knocking guys out and you're in danger of being knocked out the thrill the excitement um is light years beyond like playing flag football with your friends and that's what it is it's different between super bowl and flag football with your friends you know the, the point fighting was good and it, it does improve you to a certain degree but it, it's not the same it, it, it's not the same kind of uh dedication and and, and enjoyment that you get uh, from the sport that you get when you really are knocking each other out. And I get, I'm sure these MMA guys like the submission because I wrestled in college, by the way. Mm. Of all the sports I did, that was the one I took to the fastest was wrestling. I was the MVP of my high school football team and the MVP of my high school basketball team. I ran track through the discus, shot put, ran the high hurdles, sprint medley. Um, I was an overall athlete. Yeah. And I, I did in college what, what the athletic director said is impossible. He said, son, I said, what, what sports do you have? He said, well, we got basketball, but the team's already picked. And I said, well, because I had no money to go to college. Hmm. I said, well, what other sport? He said, well, we got wrestling, which you know how to wrestle? And I said, no, but I'll try out. He goes, 
son, nobody starts a sport at the collegiate level. level. Like the first day you touch a basketball, you're going for the basketball team. You, you want to try out in college basketball. Well, I'd never wrestled, but the thing is this. I was an athlete, and my incentive to get that scholarship was my co- college degree. I was not going to be an engineer. My whole goal was to become an engineer. Like and how long, how long had you been doing Kung Fu at that point? Um, two years. So I'd done oh. Kung Fu, but Kung Fu is not collegiate wrestling. It's a different sport. It, it's it's leverage. It, it's You got to be strong. And, and man, we starved each other. We, we dehydrated. That's how I learned to lose weight the right way because I was doing it the wrong way in the beginning. I used to take x laxes to just cr- Yes, and, and and what happened was I stopped because of this. I was sitting in a movie theater and all of a sudden my back started hurting. And I'm 18 years old. My back was hurting so bad I had to leave the movie theater. Go mm-hmm. to a doctor. Now, when you're 18, you go to a doctor, you got to really be bad off because we're, we're invulnerable at that age. Yep. But I went to a doctor because my back hurt so bad. And he couldn't figure out what it was. He couldn't. And then, then he says, tell me about your life. Tell me what you're doing. And, and I told him that I was taking this x lax And he goes, well, that's it. He goes, it's not your back. It's your kidneys. Yep. He said, you're, everything's going through them. And you're destroying your kidneys, literally. And um, luckily, I was 18 years old. And everything, to, to my knowledge, I, I rebuilt everything. You know, everything's normal for me. But, but yeah, I damaged myself doing everything wrong uh, to yeah. lose weight to lose weight in, in college. That's why I believe as a fighter, I fought in four different weight divisions. You know, I won world titles in four different weight divisions. Middleweight, uh, light heavyweight, super light heavyweight, cruiserweight. And I what's won- the what's the, the the bounds on that for people who aren't fight fans? Uh, it's generally, I, I don't know, I guess it, you can say 10 to 15 pounds difference, each one. Okay, so Pretty the low close. end of middleweight is- Like super light one- heavyweight, as opposed to light heavyweight. Uh, I believe it was, by the way, it was invented on the Dennis Alexio fight because it was the day before the fight. He couldn't make weight. So the promoter didn't want to cancel an NBC Sports World contract sure. and all that money. And the promoter happened to be the association president, which is illegal in boxing. You know, if you're the president of the association, you can't be a promoter. But now Dana White and yeah. now we, we just got thrown that out the door. So yeah. the prom- the actual uh, association president invented a new weight division called super light heavyweight. And he said, you and Dennis are going to fight for that title." And so he said, this is really good for you, Don. And I go, why is it good for me? I'm, I'm 173. He's 80, 182. And he said, because if you lose, you still got your light heavyweight title. And if you win, you get another world title. That's how the promoter sold to me. And I, I looked at him, I said, look, I don't want any other titles. I'm prepared to sick fight and defend my 175. But now I got to fight a cruiserweight. That's basically what Alexio was. So what ended up happening is Alexio realized he's no 175 pounder and he just gained weight, and became a heavyweight champion. Yeah. That's what he did. He just started putting on weight. And because it's a lot easier to put it on than it is to take it off, especially as we, we all get older, right? It, it's I haven't figured out how to get younger. Clothes. Yeah, it becomes more difficult. And uh, so that's what happened right. with, with the Dennis Alexio fight, which um, I, I never say anything bad about my opponents because... Uh, that doesn't that doesn't aggrandize I mean, me. They, I, they were good. Waring was good. Maurice Smith, um, Bronco Sikatik was first K one winner. I mean, these guys were dangerous and good, and I still beat them. So if I call them all bums, then I didn't do much, right? But, but, but that's why it, your your I, your time I, in the, the ring speaks for itself. Why don't I don't understand the mentality of guys who put down their opponents? You know, say that they're wimps and they're. They can't, they can't fight, they can't punch, they can't kick. Right? Is it is it part of what we were talking about before, creating a story? Is it part it's a of promotion. the... It's, they do yeah. it for fun. I can't believe that Conor McGregor really believed Habib was not a great fighter. You can just watch the guy, he's great. And by the way, he, did, he beat Conor McGregor, right? Yep. Now, if he beats you, all the bad nothing you said about him makes you look bad. Right? right? I mean... And, and, and if he's so bad, if he's such a wimp, and he's such a quitter, and he, why are you even fighting him then, right? It, it's really, I never did that. And Benny Okidas, I talked to him. I said, Benny, you know how the fighters badmouth each other today? I, I wouldn't feel comfortable. I, I don't have anything personal against anybody I ever fought. And Benny said the same thing to me. He said, well, you know, Don, they did make more money than we did because they got on that championship wrestling. He said, but he said, I wouldn't feel comfortable either doing it. 
And I think yeah. it's reflective of at the time that you came in and, you know, we, we've had folks on the show who, you know, Bill and others. We were, were, tradi we were traditional martial artists. You were martial artists and first and foremost. And that attitude, whether you were on TV or at a competition. We bowed to each other. We don't it, spit on each other. Right. We You bow to your opponent. You show him respect. You respect his instructor and his style and his... It was a it was a different time, um, and I I know that it's promotional, and they it's more people are going to watch it. Like if you hear that I'm fighting Van Dam, more people will watch it if they hear us bad mouth each other. Right. It's just if I say what I really believe. Well, you know what? If I say what I really believe, he's going to consider it bad mouth because I, he, he's not, he never had a pro fight, as far as I know. He claims he was a world champion, but I, he doesn't. He, in an interview, he said he couldn't remember the association that gave him his world title. How can you not? Re it, it's because there is no. Association. Every every fighter I've ever talked to knows details of every every round of every fight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody knows your opponents. Look, Frank Dukes is going around. He's saying that he wants to fight me, but I'm I ducked him and all that. First of all, Frank Dukes he says he's three hundred and thirty and zero, but he can't give you one name of one opponent because it's secret. He swore into secrecy. Yet he made a movie about it. He can make a movie about it, but he can't tell you the names of his opponents. You the, the way you 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 mentioned the thing about Van Dam is is that something that might happen? Oh, absolutely. He's already really? free. He's our Van Dam had a guy that he works out with okay. contact me and say his guarantee to fight me was three million dollars. If he gets three million dollars, he'll sign the contract. And he will negotiate a percentage of the pay-per-view. That's up to him and his attorneys and you know his representation. But he will agree. He wants three million up front, and um, it, it could happen. Because let me tell you, we will sell worldwide. You know this guy um, yeah. Logan Paul. Those guys, yeah. they don't sell in Germany and Italy right. and all over the world. But me and Van Dam would. If if but I'm saying the pay-per-view operators in those countries. Would just buy the rights from whoever there, has the there's, rights in America. That would have a chance if it was promoted right of being the biggest pay per view of all time. Me and Van Dam fighting it, you know, they're doing eight rounds, but why not twelve? That's what I'm used to fighting. And if he claims he's a world champion, world champions fight twelve. You know, um, you know, I, I haven't heard him say it in a long time, but he did say it in the '80s, and it was even on one of the Blood Sport uh, posters, um, undefeated middleweight champion. And I tell people. You, he is undefeated. When you've never had one pro fight, you got no losses. How would you prepare for something like that? Same way I always do. Same uh, thing. Can, cardio. Can you... First cardio, running mm -hmm. six miles, nine miles a day, jumping rope. I jump rope for an hour straight. Um, I get my cardio up because I don't have to learn anything. Mm. And it, what watching him fight, he's got no fights to watch. You know, this, and I don't believe in that stuff anyway, because you know what? If you think you're worried about the guy's right hand, you see him, not, he's knocked out six guys with the right hand. He might, while you're looking for that right hand, he might throw the left hook and mm -hmm. knock you right out. So I don't put a lot of stock in the pre, in, in, in self-defense, if a guy throws a beer at you in a nightclub, how much time do you, how much do you know about his fighting style? Nothing. So as a martial artist, we have to be able to go from zero to 100 miles an hour. And I just took that with me into the kickboxing ring. I watch them a little bit. But for me, the actual experience of being in the ring with them, checking how fast they are, the reflexes, um, that means more to me. I, I can analyze the fighter faster that way mm. than studying them. Uh, spend 100 hours watching tapes. In the first couple of minutes of the fight, I'll know everything I need to know. You know, and, uh, and you know, because we have a feeling out pro process, most experienced fighters, yeah. me, guys like Benny or Kiddos, they say, oh, they slow starters. No, we're going 100% in the first round, but I'm doing more watching than I am striking. Yeah. You know, um, and I tell people, I throw up a smoke screen. They go, what do you mean smoke screen? I said, I'll throw stuff. The guys think I'm trying to hit them, and that is not what I'm trying to do. I will do that for three or four rounds. I call it rocking the baby to sleep. Because mm -hmm. by the fifth round, the guy hasn't been stunned. I haven't hit him with a solid body shot. I haven't stunned. He gets a feeling of 
Like he's safe mm-hmm. in the ring. And and that's how I knock guys out. I, you know, I got 48 knockouts. Most fighters with 48 knockouts, they would say, oh, he's a knockout fighter. Marciano, I think he had 49. But people call me a technician because during the fighting, I don't get punched in the face. I mean, I've, I've had 12 round fights where the leather of my opponent's glove never touched the skin of my face. So I don't take punches to give them. I come from the traditional point fighting where you don't let a guy touch you. And when guys crowd me, I close the gap. I go closer to them. Because mm-hmm. I tell people, if you step back, like in Bronco City, everybody ran for him because he knocked out 20 straight guys. If you go away, he's used to going forward. He can still put as much, if not more, power into his punch. But I would start to step back. He would step forward. Then I, I moved. I moved forward. Mm-hmm. And when it, it was like a one, two, three, I step back. He comes forward chasing me. Then I come forward on that third move. He's thrown off. All of a sudden, he's ready for that big right hand, and my head is here on his chest. Mm. And now, for a split second, he's disoriented, and then that's when I was landing punches on him. I knocked – he he, had, he was undefeated, European champion, and I knocked him out in the seventh round. Oh. It took six rounds to, to rock that baby to sleep. When he felt comfortable, he charged me, put me up against the ropes, threw three right hands. I threw a right hook. Ruptured his eardrum, broke his jaw. When he hit the ground, he broke his nose. One punch. Yeah. Was there anybody from that era that you wanted to fight, but you just, it didn't happen? Many. Yeah? Many. Any yeah. names that we might recognize? I had fight offers, but Rob Common. Okay. Rob Common was a great fighter. We should have fought. We were in around the same weight division. Um, they offered me a fight with him. But it was less money than I was getting to fight easy guys in America. So I said, no, the money's not right. If the money had been right, I would have gone, fought it. Wouldn't have mattered because, like I said, my ultimate goal as a martial artist was to improve myself as a martial artist. So fighting the best guys is how you improve. Mm. Now, secondarily, I want to make as much money as I can. So that's the reason why I fight with me and Rob Common. Uh, I will say this. Um, Ernesto Hoost, I didn't fight him. He's one of the guys. He was called Mr. Perfect. He was one of K1 champions. Uh, Ernesto Hoos fought Bronco Sigatik and that, got knocked out twice. Mm. So I didn't feel as much pressure against Ernesto because I said, I knocked out the guy that knocked him out. And I said that what, once he was in England. We were in England together making appearances. And he goes, why did you back out of the fight with me? I said, what fight with you? I said, I never agreed to fight you. And he goes, well, I, they had the posters printed and everything. Well, I said, well, okay, somebody might have printed some posters, but I'd never had a fight with you back out and I said why would I back out with you when I knocked the guy out that knocked you out twice and I said it right in front of the big crowd and um he had nothing to say <laughs> but there's not much he can say right he no. got knocked out twice by Bronco Sikatik Bronco Sikatik got the courage to come to Florida and fight me in my hometown Orlando and I knocked him out now if I had just won a close decision against Bronco there'd been a question to this day people would be saying eh, maybe Don didn't win maybe he did and maybe you know, because the local judging and, and all that kind of crap. But when the guy is, like I said, when the guy is, well, it's not a nice term. I, I just call it flopping like a fish on the floor. You know, uh, there's no arguing. There's right. no arguing. You know, and there wasn't for Bronco. You know, who he never your, Who was your favorite fighter to watch? Johnny Terrio. Why? Um, great defense. Everybody talks about his offense. And he has the probably, I don't know. You could check this, Google it maybe. He probably has the best knockout record in the history of kickboxing, John Terry. But that's not the part of it that his defense was great. I mean, he never, you know, he's like, uh, if you ever watched Alexis or Guayle, Alexis has worked my corner before. I knew him. He's in my, from Miami, where he lived in Miami. But um, yeah, Johnny Terry had a great defense, did take a lot of punishment, knocked a lot of guys out. And under his rules, the rules that he fought under full contact style, he was probably the best. Now, I fought him, and they called it a draw, 12-round draw. I felt I outpointed him. But under that style of fighting, especially since my fight just before that was a Thai kickboxing match in, in Hong Kong, two months before, you know, I I did something he didn't do. I, I went and I fought uh, Muay Thai, hmm. Japanese kickboxing, and full contact style, which is the Western style. Um, he was better to me at that, I believe, 
even though they called it a draw, even though I did feel like I outpointed him, uh, consistently he proved that's the style of kickboxing he's good at. Mm. The style where it's only above the waist. Because, you know, he concentrated on his hands and mainly his right hand. Now, when you throw the right hand, you don't have your weight on the back foot. It's in the lead leg. So as he's throwing it, if you kick that lead leg, you do the damage. Yeah. And if he had fought in Thailand, that's what they would have done. They would have mm. thrown 20 kicks every round in his lead leg. And no matter what he tried to do, you, you're not going to, you just think about it. If your back leg, your weight is there, you can't throw a real right hand. Yeah. The weight is, yeah. So, you know, Johnny's had a certain set of rules that he was the greatest at. And um, it was the full contact style. And he's, I will relinquish the, that, that style of fighting to him. You know, but some people call me the greatest of all time and all that. Kind of, you can't tell any of that stuff. That's all conjecture. And it, it really is. It's fun for people to argue about. This, it is. This. It is a lot of fun. Unless you really fight, you don't know what would happen. Right. Yeah. Unless you, and Ali used to say this. Ali used to say, I'm the greatest. You know why? And I go, why? And he goes, because if I fight you 10 times, I'll win six out of 10. He's not saying he he would win every one, mm. and I believe that about Ali. Don't you? Don't you think he, there's not a guy in his day that would beat him? Would beat him six out of ten times. Yeah. He he would he would figure them out. He would outsmart them by the second or third one. You know, I mean, he might make a few mistakes. He'll correct them, and then he'll beat you. He's got certain things that he could do better than anybody, and that was moving around the ring. To this day, you don't see lightweights moving like that. No. No. On the balls of his feet, just dancing around the ring. He was I, fast. Yes. And then when he was this plant, he'd score with the left hand and knock guys out with right hands. You know, he didn't have the big uppercut like Foreman. He didn't have the big left hook like Frazier. He had the right hand, but he hit guys right on the chin. He hit him on the chin so much, they said it was a phantom punch, you know, with like with Sonny Liston. But it's not. It's not. You know, real fighters know. I know it takes very little to knock somebody out if you just land right there. And, you know, the gloves Ollie wore were the gloves that I wore in the 70s. They're horsehair. They're not foam padding. They're literally, if you cut them open, there's hair in there. And supposedly it came from a horse. <laughs> and that's what they stuff them with. So that is, it protects your knuckles, but it really translates into a hard shot on the chin. Yeah. You know, they used to have huge cuts on guys like Marciano. I mean, cuts right across their noses and stuff because those gloves are different than the gloves we use today. Yep. It's not that they hit harder then. You know, they, they hit hard today as much then, but the gloves protect. They, you know, I, I think, um, cut, who wants to lose a fight on a cut? You know, I, I, I got headbutted accidentally. Who wants to time. win a fight on a cut? I, I don't. I don't, but I, I got cut myself though once and it was book all coming into my eye. I couldn't see out of my left eye at all. And um, the referee came over there and took a look at it and I thought they were going to stop the fight. They're just thinking, I'm going to lose my world title. I'm way ahead on points. Yeah. And the guy, and it, I'm not saying the guy's a dirty fighter. He accidentally headbutted. I'm pretty sure, 100% sure he accidentally hit, headbutted me. And it might have been even something that I do because like I told you, I like to close the gap. Mm. So I was probably trying to get in real tight and I bumped it, we bumped heads, and it, but it was going right directly into my eye. And it's weird, you know, it, it, all of a sudden you got, lose your depth perception because you're mm. only one. And it, to me, it didn't, you know how you think, oh, it's going to go black? To me, it's, it's like gray. It was weird. It was weird. I never had blood cover my eye where I couldn't see. But um, yeah, that was uh, 1990. Mm. And I retired right after that fight because. I was afraid, you know what, I'm doing these movies and I don't need the money. I got, you know, the, uh, in fact, the time that I um, take to get in shape to, to fight back then, I'd lose money. And, you know, when you do something and you lose money or cost you money, it's not a career. It's called a hobby. Okay. <laughs> Kickboxing, because it wasn't making me big money. And the movies, because it was, you know, I've, done, I've, literally, I've made millions of dollars as an actor, believe it or not, you know. And um, of course, I spend it like everybody else as fast as possible. <laughs> well, sure. Got to keep the but, economy um, going. But, but even at the B movies, you know, I, you, when you, I would do five movies a year. Hmm. And you can do the math. And I get 20000 a film. 20 would go my agent. I get two hundred grand. And um, 
they all made a profit because they were all, it's all about video mm -hmm. and the videos were being rented. You know, people would go every weekend to the video stores to see what they're going to watch that weekend. And if I had, I had five movies in 13 months, I released once shot, released five movies in 13 months. Entertainment weekly came to me and said they wanted to do an article because to their knowledge, no actor in America had ever done that, but video didn't exist. Right. Mm -hmm. That's why. And, and Tom Cruise doesn't need five movies in 13 months. Yeah. Actually, they, they were calling it five movies in a year. He shot and released, but it wasn't really that. But, but Entertainment Weekly said that it was it was 13 months. But they were all shot in one year, but that one of them was released the next year. Sure. And um, yeah, nobody, nobody does that. You, now, as a character actor, you can appear in 20 movies like Michael Madsen will do and Eric Roberts. But to be the star of one genre, like all uh, martial art movies, which they were for me, you know, that, that's all I started. If I'm not kicking, I'm not in the movie. Hmm. If, if some, let's say we've got somebody who doesn't know your catalog of films or maybe somebody younger, what, what, what movie should they start with? Red Sun Rising. Okay. Is that your favorite it's, one that you've done? It's an HBO world premiere. I did four of them and okay. it's, uh, it's got a little of everything. It's got a love story. With, you know, there's a female cop, there's a relationship. Uh, it's got good character actors, Mako and Michael Ironside, mm -hmm. Edward Albert. Uh, it's just a well-made movie. The, the director was very experienced. Um, he's passed away, but he was a British director. And he came here, and that was the first movie he did in the U.S. And uh, he just did a great job. Now, look, I'd like to take all the credit, but I did what I normally do. I memorize my lines, and I give my performance. Directors adjust them. They, they might say, hey, you know, you're coming off too strong there. You you know, you, you need to back off a little bit or, you, you know, the director's direct your performance. So if you see a movie and you hear a guy who wins an Oscar, go look up the director because that actor is given the performance the director. Unless you, I guess, I guess unless you're Tom Cruise, because you can just tell the director, hey, this is the way I want to do it. <laughs> I heard that to Spielberg, by the way. Spielberg had a scene. He told Tom what to do. Tom said, come over here. And they supposedly... And I'm hearing this from the stuntman. The stuntman, he was behind an airbag. And next to the airbag, they didn't know that the stuntmen were hearing them. Spielberg was telling Tom Cruise why he thought he should do this certain thing in the scene. And Tom said, look, my character, regardless, my audience does not want to see me like that. Now, I don't know what it is, crying. or I, He said, my audience does not. Not mm. want to see whatever Spielberg. Now this is Steven Spielberg. Can, can you imagine being such a big actor that you can tell Steven Spielberg, "Thank you for your notes, but these are unnecessary." Right. Well, well, they they're not coming to see Spielberg. It's true. That movie is was called. It was the one with the aliens coming to Earth. Uh, War of the Worlds. Yeah. He did the remake of War of the Worlds, yep. and that was the one Spielberg. Yeah. So that's. I was told this by a stunt co coordinator. He said we were behind this airbag hanging out and laying there and we heard Spielberg talk called Tom Cruise because mm. he's not going to do anything like that. They're not going to have a discussion like that in front of the crew. No. So they thought they were alone. Mm. And he told me he, he and oh, he brought that up because we were working together and he was directing me in a movie. And he was trying to say he to me then he says he knows that in the end, it's me that my audience is coming to see like. But, but you know what? I relinquish any power I have on movie sets because there can only be one captain of the ship and that's the director. Yeah. And I try to give the directors what they want. Yeah. And um, I rarely have had any, you know, uh, there's one time though. There is one director and one time. It's the only movie I made that there are scenes in the movie I'm ashamed of. You don't have Not to from... name it if you don't want to, but I'd love it if you did. Which one? It's a movie called Black Belt. Now, here's the reason why I don't like it. I know what happens. You, if I say the name of the movie, everybody says, oh, I'm going to go see this movie. This is the one movie Don Wilson regrets. But but I called the director, the Twilight Zone director. We got into an argument on the set. He wanted me to kick my foot, point of my boot, closer to the other actor's face. I said, wait a minute. I'm not, this is not even safe what I'm doing. I'm not going to get closer to his face. You move the camera six inches to this side, and then it won't show. He had the camera here, and I'm throwing the kick right. so you could see the angle. 
It's the angle. And the name yeah. of the actor is Matthias Hughes. And Matthias Hughes is the gutsiest, nicest guy you will ever meet in your life because he just trusts me not to blind mm. him with my... I was wearing a cowboy boot. It has a point on it. And I'm the director wants me to get that closer to his face because it looks like a miss because he's got the camera in the wrong spot. Was it his and first I, martial arts flick? Right. Now, that director wrote a script. Now, the only reason he wrote the script is this. Roger Corman comes to me and says, Don, what movie do you want to make and who do you want to direct it? And I tell him, this guy, this, well, I might as well say, his name's Chuck Moore. <laughs> and the movie's Nick called Black Belt. But I said, well, he, he's a screenwriter. He can write the script and direct it. And I, I, I like him and I believe we should. So I got him the job. That's the thing. So he comes to me and he says, Don, I'm not changing anything in this script because if they didn't think I could do the job, they wouldn't have gave it to me. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm the one that gave you the, the job. job. Right. And you're telling me I have to. The scene was this. There's a guy, a serial killer, it's Matthias Hughes. He's a big, tall, blonde guy. I don't know if you know him as an actor, but he's well known. And the director says, We have to show why he's killing women. We have to show the reason. I said, No, you don't have to show. Why did Jaws eat all those people on that island? It doesn't show that. The shark swimming around. He can't find enough fish, so he starts. To, look, it the character, the bad guy, is defined by his actions. Hmm. He's just an evil man because he murders women. Why he does it? It's why does Hannibal Lecter eat people? We never, they never have a scene where you see him. He thinks they taste good. I don't know. We don't know because they didn't show anything like that. You know, it's it's. He's defined by what he did. Now he made he was a scary bad guy in Hannibal Lecter. So this guy's a scary guy. And I said, he kills women. We don't have to show why. But the director wrote a scene where he's got this young kid sitting on his mother's lap, and she's saying, I'm gonna make you my little husband. So like he was sexually molested by his mother. So he grows up hating women. And that's why he's a serial killer. He's, it's a very distasteful, distasteful scene. And if you're ever going to show anything like that in a movie, you should do it the way Jodie Foster did with this. There was a rape scene where a girl gets raped on a pool table and it's based on a reality thing. And Jodie Foster was directing it. And you, you do it. You do it for the right reason. You don't use incest as a. It has to move the story forward. If it doesn't move the story forward, there's no point. Well, you know what? It, to me, it stopped the movie, the, the movie yeah. dead tracks. It didn't do anything. It didn't sell one more ticket. Yeah. Like people aren't going to say, oh, well, we don't learn why he kills women. Well, then I'm not going to rent it. Right. it. It's not like that. And anyway, we that director and I never worked together again. Mm. And most of the directors, I've, I've, I've done multiple films with them because we get along. Um, but, you know, I, I have what they call a mutual approval contracts. In other words, every aspect of filmmaking, if I don't want to do it, I, I don't have to. Mm. I didn't like the scene or but but I have never enforced that. I've never forced some director or producer and including this guy. I never forced I told him that's what I believe we should just cut that scene out. He didn't agree, kept it in. So um yeah, I I um have never enforced it, but I, but you know, I, I, I keep it in my contracts because just in case. Oh, there is a scene. I'm not gonna tell you this director's name though. Okay. But um he wants me to do rear nudity in a movie. Because you know, I guess Van Damme's done it once. I don't remember. Nobody wants I, I think Van Damme did it more than once. Okay. Okay. People well, like seeing his butt. You know, he was the number two or three actor in the gay community when he was doing blood sport and kickboxer and all those, which is nothing wrong with that. You can be popular for the gay community. But if you show your rear end, I mean you, you know, I, anyway. I, I, t I told the director, what do you want me to do this? Well, I'm in a whirlpool. And he said, you'll just reach for the towel. And, and then you'll, sh so he said, there's nothing sexual about it. You're not going to be having sex. And I, I'm thinking to myself, I said, you know what? There's not a single person renting my movies. Cause back, you know, video, it's going to say, oh, Don Wilson shows his butt. Oh, I better get this one. And, oh, Don doesn't show his butt. Oh, I'll, I'll wait for the next. I said, nobody's renting my movies to see my butt. I said, they're renting them to watch me kick butt. That's what I told the director. And I, I I cut that scene right out of the movie. That that should be on a poster right there. That that phrase. They don't just... see pay to see my butt. They see pay to see me kick. Butt. There, there's your there's your movie poster. Yeah. For your well, new... that's a true story. That's about one of my movies. And uh, uh, yeah, but I did show my butt in the movie. Okay. 
wow, this is this has been a ride. Uh, I know you're on social media. Yeah, Facebook. Website. Facebook you know, wanna... if, if people want to follow you and stay up on what you're doing. Oh, yeah, yeah. Listen, I when I travel around, I take pictures. You know, I'm, I'm not like Cynthia Rothrock. She is like meticulous about it. It's like a Great. job for her. I said you, you should be getting paid putting uh, all this information out. But but I I do I I, I put it on. And I talk to people all over the world and um, I enjoy it. And they, you know I, I like being in contact with my friends through Facebook. Uh, I was in Iraq a couple of years ago and um, called my wife from the hotel. It, it is free Facetime Facetime. Yeah. I just got I could see her and I um, yeah. Do when we had the shutdown, I, I was in Iraq. Uh, uh, signing the uh black belt of the president of iraq's like nephew or something anyway that's, oh, that's cool it's weird that the things you do yeah uh, well the, the the um president of chechnya invited me mayweather and uh um, i mark saw Martin, that I mark saw that. to his birthday party yeah so we all flew there to his birthday party yeah <laughs> he's a big fight fan the president of chechnya you know um i don't know what's going on now but i think gosh you know Putin's causing so much trouble in that area because I, I I did like uh, eight seminars in Ukraine about a year ago, year and a half ago, and um, you know Ukraine is just like Russia. It's like it's like we rode tanks into Canada because we don't like something they're doing, and then we call. I, I'm, them I'm gonna I'm gonna ask that we draw a hard line there. I try really oh, yeah, not to yeah, let yeah. politics you know come in. Stop to put politics right 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 here. But anyway, but anyway, um, uh, I was in Ukraine and they're they're not. I taught seminars there and mm -hmm. you know, great people, just like the Russians. I, I go to Russia, Russia. I'm very popular there. And their their people are just great people as well. Um, two more questions for you. First one, if you could go back now, you could get in a time machine and go back to, you know, let's say 18, maybe right around that first fight and talk to 18 year old you, what would you say? Well, I make some mistakes as a fighter, and uh, I, I would correct. One of them is, it's not just a saying that you, anybody can be knocked out at any time by anybody. Like the worst opponent you ever face, could still knock you out if you're not careful. And because that actually happened to me, it's not not just hearsay. The guy's record was nine and six. He knocked me out in the first round. He had three more fights, so now his record's ten and six. He had three more fights after that. He got knocked out on all three, and he retired with a 10 and nine record. So the fighter with the worst record knocked me out in the first round. So it's not a saying for me to say, oh, anybody that got, the... he was called a tune-up bout, first of all. <laughs> the tune-up bout knocked me out in the first round. I was TKO'd, went down, got up, but I was too dizzy to fight. So I would have told myself, you got to keep your defense. And I, you know, young fighters come in the gym and I said, listen, defense first. Make sure you're not going to get hit. Oh, sorry, I apologize, Mike. Forgot this phone is off. Hello. Please leave a message after the call. If you got your home covered with a warranty plan. Oh, you know, I, I, I love that it's going full circle, right? We yeah. talked about this at the beginning that it's always yeah. a scam. Defense first. Yeah, defense first. That that that's wish. You know, I wish somebody told that the first day. Now I learned that. I don't remember when in my career, but where. I made it so that my opponents would not score on me. Mm. Therefore, it took it all the pressure off my offense, right? If you go through a round without being hit, all you got to do is land two jabs, you win that round. And so, um, you know, that's one thing. The other thing is, uh, it's very easy to knock people out. All you have to do is hit them with a the punch they're not expecting. That's how you knock people out. If the guy's ready for it, and he's he's all, you're not going to knock him out. You're going to hit his head and knock him around. But you get him, to, I tell him, you get him to look at heckle, and you hit him with Jekyll. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's that, That's a very simple strategy. Throw kicks high, and then you drop down low, throw a body shot. Kick low, and then come over the top of the overhand right and knock guy out. So setting people up, it's it's um, you get them thinking one thing, mi like misdirecting them kind of, you know, like get somebody to look at the, well, the matador with the uh, cape. The bull looks at the cape, not the guy's body, and he and he gets mad, and then he goes for the cape, and the guy, and he keeps missing the guy. And that, that kind of strategy doesn't just work on bull fights; it works in the real fight game. There's a reason I keep my one hand down. I keep it down because it looks open, and guys try to throw overhand rights when I'm southpaw. 
They try to hit southpaws with right hands, and I counter it with my side kick to the body. So I'm thinking like two moves in advance, you know. And and like a chess player, you got to think a few um, techniques in advance, mm -hmm. maybe even a few rounds in advance. You know, it just happened. This is a coincidence in my. It was not planned strategy, but it worked out this way. My last fight was a ten round fight. I couldn't throw right hands because I had fractured my rib the week before the fight. So I was afraid if I threw the right hand, that exposed all this, right? The guy might kick it. He might hit it. So I kept my right hand here the whole fight. And it's the ninth round or 10th round, and I'm not winning. Both my corners saying it's close, and it's his hometown, Atlantic City. He's main event here many times. You're not. He, and my trainer said, look at those crowds in his sold-out crowd. He goes, if he gets the decision, there's not going to be any booing. He's going to be cheered out of here because it's a close fight. And he's a hometown guy. He goes, you got to knock him out. So last round, 10th round, you got to knock him out. So I, I stood up and I thought, well, you know what? I might as well throw the right hand now, right? I mean, it's the last round. I might as well. And think of it. His, he had not been hit with a good right hand the whole fight. Yeah. So his left was down. I took nine rounds to set him up. Not purposely, though. Nobody would have the patience, the guts to wait nine rounds before you throw the right. I threw the right hand, knocked him out. The ring announcer gets the microphone. Ladies and gentlemen, winner by knockout in the 10th and final round with four seconds left on the clock. And I, when I told the Holyfield that story, he burst out laughing because if you had given me a script that said that, I'd say, no, he's going to believe that. The guy's a close fight. He's probably going to lose it. He knocks him out with four seconds. But that's my life. That, that's my that's reality for me. My last fight, I won in the last four seconds. I love it. Because love it. so you set guys up. The, the moral of the story is you're asking for techniques. That I would have told myself, take your time, set guys up. You know, don't wait to the last four seconds, though. Mm. <laughs> that just worked for me. But generally, um, you know, you got to have um, defense first. Don't get scored on. Take some pressure off your offense. And then when you use your offense, you get the guy thinking one thing, and then you hit him with something else. And that's, you know, it's not rocket science. It's not rocket. That, that basically, you can be successful. I had a 28 year successful kickboxing career. That's pretty much the basics. Yeah. I worked defense first, which was different. Most guys don't. They, they sure. get in the gym. They're all about what am I going to hit today? They're not about getting in the ring, start moving. I watched Duran. Duran thinks more like me as well. But, well, at least when I, when I saw him training for Leonard, the first fight, he was in Miami and um, yeah, he, he was doing the moving around the ring for 20 minutes, warming up. Just slipping punches, not not even really worried about throwing. He just moving, bobbing, weaving, and and man, I, when I looked at him, I thought, wow, if he decides he doesn't want to get hit by Leonard, he's not going to get hit because he just looks so great defensively. Yeah. And think about it, this is a guy like Duran, who's, who's a great fighter, real experience, and yet these young amateurs come in there and they don't do five minutes of warm up like that. Hmm. They don't want to spend the time in the ring. They just want to get their gloves on and start punching the bag. Yeah, fundamentals. Fundamentals. Yeah, fundamentals. And so those are the two things, you know. Um, and so I got, I've got one more question for you. And this this is instead of the other question, which was, what hmm. would you tell you? This is what oh. would you tell our audience here today? Uh, we've got people from all over the world. They train in different ways and for different reasons. Yeah. What would you leave them well, with today? You know, what I, you know what I'd like to say to your audience, anybody who sees this, is I have had in my life two careers. One was a pro fighter. And one was pro actor. And neither career would have been successful if it wasn't for the audience. Because nobody makes money as a fighter if you don't have the stands full of people. Nobody makes money as an actor if people aren't watching it, if the Nielsen ratings aren't high, or because it wasn't theatrical for me. And, and, or, and they're not renting the videos. And they're not buying the DVDs. The only way I was able to have the fun I had, because it was really a lot of fun being a boxer, and the successful secondary career that Chuck Norris suggested I do, the acting, is because of the audience. Mm -hmm. It's because of them. Directly as a result of their support, I was able to have people tell me, Todd, you're the luckiest guy in the world. You're the luckiest kickboxer. Ever. You're the lucky actor. You know, actors don't come out here and then two two years later start on each HBO. Because it doesn't happen. Like millions of people come every year to be actors. And it doesn't happen. You know, they don't get to be stars in movies that often. How many kickboxers can you say start in 30 films? And not all you, films, Hollywood films. None. 
I'm it. Yeah. I, I'm here. So a lot of people thought, oh, you're a world champion, champion kickboxer. That's why you started in all these movies. I said, no. It maybe got, got my break in the beginning, but um, it wasn't that. It was, um, you know, I, I had support from millions of people all over the world who supported my movies, supported my fight career. And uh, so I'd like to say thank you to all of them. Because, and that, that's how, if the last thing I said, the, the ending the, the interview is thank you to all the fans. Thanks for tuning in. Thank you to Don Wilson for coming on the show. Had a great time. Really appreciated your openness, your honesty. Listeners, viewers, thanks for spending some time with us. Head to whistlekick.com for all the stuff that we do. Whistlekickmartialartsradio.com to get more out of this episode. Subscribe to our newsletter. Bring me in for a seminar. Hire us to help grow your martial arts school. So many ways that we can help you in our mission to connect, educate, and entertain the traditional martial artists of the world. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.